Well, good morning. How y'all doing? All right, I'm not going to ask you. Everybody brought their Bibles this morning to make you hold them up because I had one person came to me this morning and explained to me they forgot theirs. So I'm not going to tell you who that was. I just want to let you know it does happen from time to time. So because of that, we provided a pew Bible for you. If you didn't have one with you, you can pull it out today. If you're using the pew Bible and you're over 50, you probably need some spectacles so you can see the words that are in there. Uh, but we're going to read from that. And I'm actually going to be in three different passages of Scripture today. So what I want you you to do is when you open your Bible, I just want you to kind of leave it open. Now, I won't require you to turn to John 3.16, which is the first passage. Do you have any idea why I might not require you to turn to John 3.16? You better know it. That's right. If you've got John 3.16, you will not be required to open your Bible to look at that this morning. But when it comes to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, I don't know if you've got that memorized. I'm going to assume that you don't have the whole section memorized. So I want you to turn to it, and then as we get near the third point of my message this morning, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. So I want you to be ready to go there. And what I want you to take away from the message this morning is that Jesus is God's gift to believers. And all the believers said, Amen. Now our gift to others is an extension of that love. You know, on the very first Christmas morning some 2,000 years ago, God showed his love for, uh, for us. He showed his love for all the past believers who had ever lived. He showed his love for all of those who believed in Yahweh God at that time. And he showed his love for all of us that will yield our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. And, and he, he sent Jesus, who was fully God, to be born of a woman so that he could demonstrate abundant life to us. Jesus' life shows us what abundant life looks like. And that's why Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Now, as his followers, and I hope everyone in here today is a follower, we have a wonderful opportunity to take action by speaking truth into the lives of the other people that we're going to come in contact with just this week as we see them from day to day. As we surround ourselves around them, we can surround them with the love of Jesus as well. Now, as I began to put this message that God laid in my heart together, I thought I'd go look up something in the Bible. So I wanted to look and see an instance in the Bible where Jesus gave somebody a material present to give it to them, to kind of jump off from. And you know what I found? I couldn't find in the Scriptures where Jesus had given a thing, a material possession to somebody Yet Jesus Christ is the greatest giver who has ever given. So I think the reason for that is, is the fact that what he gave is himself. He gave everything he was. And that's why God says, and we read this over in the book of James, that every good and perfect gift comes from where? Our heavenly Father above, if you finish quoting the scripture, is that he's the one who gives to us. So, so by giving his life, we receive a lot. And we don't receive a particular thing that we don't receive a, an iPod or an Xbox or whatever, it is, whatever the latest game is. We don't receive that. But what we do receive in Jesus Christ is we have received salvation. If you have received salvation, would you please say amen? amen. Okay. All right, watch it. Uh, he all, not only do we receive salvation, we receive redemption. In other words, we had been kidnapped by Satan and we had to be a ransom that had to be paid and Jesus Christ became that ransom. And then we have, the, we have all been adopted by God so now we are children of God because, we've, because we know who He is because He has forgiven us and forgiveness is another thing that He gives to us. He, choo he separates us from our sin as far as the east is from the west and He chooses to remember that no more. And then He gives us the gift of sanctification and that's why I as your pastor are always telling you that love, God loves loves you just the way that you are, but, and what's the rest of that? He loves you far too much to let you stay that way, so he's going to transform you into who it is that you need to be. And he also gives us his righteousness, and you know, to get into heaven, you have to be righteous, and no one is righteous, the scripture says, no, not one, so God gives us a seal of righteousness on us, and not only does he do that, but he gives us a thing called regeneration where he takes who we are and all that stuff that we can't change in us, God comes in and he begins to change that from us. And I'm here to submit to you this morning 
that that is far better than one of those new GMC pickup trucks with the tailgate that flips down on the back side that you have to make payments on for seven years at $2,000 a month. I mean, the reason we don't see Jesus giving uh, material gifts so much in the scripture is because there's so many things that are so much greater than any of that. And it all comes from Jesus. See, this Christmas, don't be confused with a fictitious giving character, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe, somebody, maybe somebody wants to think about the elf on the shelf, or maybe somebody wants to think about uh, the, the tooth fairy or something. Come around. Realize that God is an absolute reality, and in his absolute reality, he is the one who is providentially causing everything to happen and is able to make everything work out for, for his glory and our good at the same time. So as we realize this, we realize that he loves us. He loves you, he loves me, and he compels us to reflect that love that he's given us onto the people we've come in contact with. So I'm going to break my message this morning down into three parts, and this is about what they look like. The first part is going to have to do with how God demonstrated his love for us. The second is going to have to do with how God defines what love is, because I do think that in the society we live today, there's some confusion over what love is. If you agree with me on that, would you please say amen? Amen. I think it's one of the greatest travesties in the United States of America is we have a definition of love that looks nothing like what God talks about as love in Scripture. When we can get the two of those lined up and find out that our love is supposed to look like His love, it makes all the difference in the world. And in the third place, I'm going to go to what God demands from you. And what God demands from you is to love others like He has loved you. And we're going to look at that in the Scripture. So everybody either look at John 3.16 right now or think it in your mind. Now I'm going to quote the one that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but what? Everlasting. Have everlasting life. So what does that mean? All right, God, God's love for us is amazing. The Bible teaches us that every good and perfect gift comes from God. So I want you to remember this Christmas. Now let's listen to me close. See, I want the teenagers to listen. I want the children to listen. I want the mamas and daddies to listen. I want the grandparents to listen. I want the aunts and the uncles and people to listen. And if you don't have anybody but you're in your family but yourself, I want you to listen. So do y'all know who I'm talking to now? I think it's everybody. If I left you out, I didn't mean to. But I want everybody to listen to this. Now I said that so long I forgot what it was I wanted to tell you. I, I did. Let's see. The Bible. Okay, the Bible teaches that every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father above. Every gift that you get from, for Christmas this year does not come from God. Hmm. Now how can that be? Because Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whomever he can to devour and he masquerades as an angel of light. So he likes to come in and give people things that people don't need. Just out of curiosity, has anybody in here ever seen somebody receive something that they shouldn't have received? Or perhaps in your own life you received something that after you got it you realized you really didn't want it because it caused so much problems in your life or it pulled you away from God instead of driving you to God. See, so not every gift that you're going to get is from God. See, the Bible teaches that every good and perfect gift comes from God. The main gift from God that changes everything is Jesus Christ. For God so loved, He gave. Okay, so there's the gift that's coming from Him. He was born, and in His birth we see wise men bringing Him gifts but him not taking gifts to the wise men. You, you see how that happened? Remember when Jesus is beginning to grow up, he's no longer in the manger now. He's probably living in the city somewhere around Bethlehem or, or Jerusalem in this area. And the star shines over and the three magi, the three wise men come to him and they bring him three gifts. Now how many people can remember what those gifts were? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, okay? So they bring us, and each of the one of us has a biblical significance. I'm not going there into text right now. But you want you, what I want you to understand is that is not God giving the wise men a gift. That is the wise men giving the gift back to God, okay? The whole thing about this material possession stuff, and listen, listen to me close. God loves you, and he's going to meet your needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And he will provide you with whatever you need to carry out whatever it is he wants you to carry out in your life. But God is not interested in making you rich. 
in material possessions. He's interested in making you rich in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave. So the gift that He gives actually turns out to be His one and only Son, His only begotten Son, His one and only Son that He gives to die on the cross for us. So He was born in His birth. We see many wise men bringing Him gifts. In His death, we see God's demonstration of love. Romans 5.28, which I'll throw up on the screen, I think, and it says in Romans 5.28, uh, but God showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Now, we just sang a song a while ago. I don't know if you caught this line in the song. It says that God had to look away, turn his face away. I want you to think about the gift that God is giving when you think about the fact that Jesus, who knew no sin, became our sin on the cross, and God's having a hard time looking at his own son, seeing him receiving God's wrath on him which should have been wrath that was poured out on you and I because every sin is always punished. Did y'all hear what I just said? Every sin is always punished. Either it's punished in a lost person by spending eternity separated from God in hell or it's, it was poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross where the wrath of God was poured on him. God the Father loved. Let me tell you how he loved. God the Father loved by sending. God the Son loved by dying. God the Father loved by raising Jesus from the dead. God the Son loved by sending the Spirit. And God the Spirit loves by giving us truth. God the Spirit loves by giving us comfort. God the Spirit gives us uh, loves by giving us joy. Because God is the greatest gift giver that there ever has been. And the gift that He gave is not material. The gift that He gave is so far superior than that. Even our minds have a hard time wrapping our understanding around that. Which brings me to the second point, because I think if we can understand this second point better, we'll understand less is important about material things and more things that are important in this world is who you love and who loves you and how much you love that you have in your life. You see, the second part of the message is God defined love to us. God defined. So would you take out your Bible right now and turn to 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8. Now while you're turning to 1 Corinthians verses 4 through 8, I want to remind you of something that happened in Jesus' life where he demonstrated, where he's, he's, he's demonstrating love. The place I'm going to take you to is the is the, the recorded event or the parable or however which way you want to look at this where Jesus is standing around with many of the people and one of the person is trying to justify themselves by just trying to decide who is it that they love. Who do I love? Do I have to love this guy? Do I love that guy? And Jesus, Jesus said this. That's when he told him, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. So the guy looks back at Jesus and he says, well, who's my neighbor? And he starts on what we call as the Good Samaritan. And as the Good Samaritan was going from Jerusalem, and he was going down from Jerusalem, he was going over to Jericho, and he's traveling on his way. Some robbers come, and they strip him, and they beat him, and they leave him naked in the road and beat up with his wounds. And then along comes the Levi, and he looks at him, and then along comes the priest, and he looks at him and walks by. But then along comes the Samaritan. When the Samaritan comes by, he sees him, he picks him up, he patches his wounds, he cleans him up, he washes him off, he puts him on his animal, and when he takes his donkey or horse or whatever it is, and he goes to the next city, and when he gets to, to the next city, he says, he gets takes him into the innkeeper and he gives him to the innkeeper and he says, look, uh, I, I, want, I want to leave this guy here and you take care of him. I'll come back through in about a week or two. When I come back in a week or two, if he's got a bill left over, I'll take care of the bill that he had so that this guy is taken care of. And what Jesus was saying was, love is not a noun. See, love is an action word. Love is something that we do. You know, I use the word love so poorly in my life. You know, I say sometimes things like, I love ice cream. I love, you know, I love turkey and dress. I mean, I, it's all, these things that I love. Oh, I, I really shouldn't use this word because love is defined for us in Scripture. It's demonstrated in that. It's demonstrated in Jesus' life on the cross. It's demonstrated by the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. But then it's written down. Look at the text that you have right there in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And let's look at what the definition of love. Paul defines love for us, if you will. Paul defines love for us in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. How many of y'all ever loved somebody much, so much you wanted to kill them? 
wait a minute. If I love them, why do I want to kill them? That means your love is not patient. Okay? Love is patient and it's kind. You know, when you throw darts at the people you love, you're not being kind. Hmm. Love does not envy or boast. Why does name do not envy or boast? Because love is not about us. Love is about the one who is being loved. So there's nothing for us to boast about on ourselves. It is not arrogant and it's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. I want this. This is what I want. If you love me, you would. Have y'all ever heard that saying? If you love me, you would. All right? Well, that proves that you don't know what love is. All right? Love, it is not irritable or, or, or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. If you go on down to verse 12, which I didn't put on there, it says, faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is, y'all help me, love. love. Now why is that? Because faith turns to sight. Hope is realized. But love continues on forever. After all, John, 1 John 4, 8 says, uh, God, or tells us that God is love. God is love. Love is sacrificial. We learn from that text. Love is eternal. It doesn't have, con it doesn't have things that I'm going to stop loving you because this has happened, so therefore I can no longer love you. If you can say to someone, I no longer love you because you have done this, then your love for them never was unconditional. Okay? All right? We've got to understand that. All right. God is love. Anyone, and, and, and this, this is where we're going to go in just a second. I'm getting, kind of setting you up for this. First John says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You see, when we can get this agape love, when we can get this God love that God has in us, it changes us so dramatically. What does agape love look like? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. John 3.16, for God so loved. Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love by the action of sending his son. We love by the actions that the good Samaritan took to take care of a person that he didn't even know because he loved the stranger that much. So now we're beginning to see what love is. Let me tell you what love is not. Love is not asking you what you want for Christmas and me making sure you get what you want for Christmas this Christmas. Let me tell you what stuff does. Let me tell you what stuff does. This is what stuff does. Stuff causes you to focus on the stuff. Yeah? Think about it. How many times do you see Christmas morning? Everybody wakes up at 3.30 in the morning or 4.30, whatever. The kids wake up and they come rushing into the room. And the kids go over there and they say, where's the presents? Where's the presents? Where's the presents? And, and mom and daddy say, well, look over there. And there's all kinds of presents there. And those kids turn around and say, but before we open these presents, let us give thanks to God. <laughs> Does that happen? Does anybody think that's going to happen this Christmas morning? Why? Because their focus is not on God. Their focus is on the one who gave them the gifts, right? Whoa! If I give my child exactly what they want for Christmas and put it under the tree or out in the yard or wherever it's got to go, when they get up and get it, the first thing they're going to think is, Oh, Daddy, you're the most awesome dad that ever lived on the face of the earth. Is that what they're going to think? Now, what they're going to think? I can't believe I finally got it. See what happens to the focus? The focus is removed from the giver, and it goes to the gifts. Now, God is the giver of gifts. That's what material stuff does to us. However, when we sin and fall short of God's glory, and he forgives us, where does the focus go? God, I don't know why you love me, but you do. God, 
I am so thankful that you love. I am so thankful that you sent your one and only son and I believe in him so I can have eternal life and you are now sanctifying me and transforming me and regenerating me and forgiving me and sanctifying me and all of these wonderful things are taking place. Let's go to the third point of my sermon this, this morning. No. God demands love from us. He demands that we love him. He demands that we love other people. Now I want to read, I want you to look at, open your Bible, hold your Bible up so I know you got, you're going, or let me hear some pages turn or either, if you, if you don't have pages turn into 1 John chapter 4, would you just get, yeah, that's exactly what I want. If you got an iPad, would you just go, or phone, whatever, so I know that you get there and you can stop making the sound when I know you're there. 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. 1 John chapter 7, 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. John, by the way, remember John's the one who loved Jesus and whom, who the only way he refers to himself is the one whom Jesus loved. He's the disciple that lived the longest. He's the one, when he's writing First John, he's probably 90 years old when he's writing this down. So he's figured all this stuff out that God's revealed to him and he's seen, practiced in life. And he says these words. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from who? God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Let's woo! We know we belong to Him, not because we prayed the prayer. We know that we belong to Him, not because we got baptized in the water. We know that we belong to Him because we love like He loves. Woo! I didn't say we know we belong to Him because we lust over our loved ones. I said we know we belong to him because we love like he loves. 1 Corinthians 13, John 3, 16. Beloved, let us love. Uh, whoever, love whoever has been born of God knows God. Anyone who does not, anyone who does not love, listen to this, does not know God because God is love. Okay, wait a minute. Hmm. So you mean to tell me that the only way I can be saved is if love is in me? And the answer to that question is yes. Let me help you with it. It is God in you. You know, we talk about Emmanuel, which is what? God with us. Well, it is God in you, God in you, that loves through you. So it's him in you that's causing you to love the people that you come in contact with. If there is no God in you, you cannot love like we have defined today. Because this is the way that God loves. And the only person who can love like God is somebody who has God loving inside of them. Now we get distracted by the world. Okay, so I want to take just a couple of minutes here to close the message out. Because I want to answer this question. This is a question I want to answer. How can we give others the love of God this Christmas? How do I... I know I got the list. I'm going to buy them some stuff and wrap it up, put it on the tree, or, or make sure they get these things, or give them a, you know, all kinds of stuff. But are we really thinking about how am I going to show them that I love them? How am I going to show them that God loves them? How am I going to show them love? The first thing I want you to do is I want you to put on love. Now, I've got a wrong scripture reference there. The scripture reference right there should be 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, which is the reference that we just, uh, excuse me, not, not, excuse me, not 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me. It should be Colossians 3, 14. Colossians 3, 14. Listen to what Colossians 3, 14 says. And above all this, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony. It is the love of God in us that causes our families to have the perfect harmony that we don't have. The reason our families don't have perfect harmony within the family is because everybody in the family doesn't have the perfect love that comes from God. So what do we do? We go buy them a gift. Stop buying a gift. Start showing them what love is. Because it's so much more important. You know, a lot of old Christians figure this out. You ask an old Christian couple, go to the man and say, what you giving your wife for Christmas? Or you ask the woman, say, what you giving your husband for Christmas? And they'll say, oh, we're old enough. We got everything we want. What they really mean is we love each other so much. 
we don't need nothing. We love God so much, we don't need nothing else. And we even love the people that God puts in our lives because they understand that they put on love. The second thing we do in, in how we give others the love of God is we become selfless. Instead of thinking about what we want for Christmas and how we want to do things, we then become less selfless, which is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. If you'll notice, we read those things. Those are all things about other people, not about ourselves. So we're, in a sense, emptying ourselves for the sake of the people that we love. And the, the third thing we want to do is we want to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. That I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So what is the manner that in which we walk that is worthy of the calling that we have been called to? And he goes on and he says, with humility and gentleness, with patience. And then this is the last thing he adds to it. Bearing with one another in, guess what? Love. Love. It's all about the love. It's when you can figure out the love. Let me, let me put a side note right here. The closer the love in you looks like Jesus, the more it looks like the love that Jesus has for others, the more stable your life is going to become. I could do a whole sermon on that. But once you can focus in on God who is in you and let him do the loving through you, it's going to make all the other things begin to make sense. And you're going to love people in such a way that it's going to bring harmony to your family like it needs to come, to the people you come in contact with. And then the fourth thing is, this is, this is another love thing, speak truth into people's lives. John 8, 32 says, The truth shall set you what? Free. Free. Because that truth lets us know that God loves us and demonstrated that love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It lets us know that God is in us so we have the capacity to love everybody we come in contact with. And then the fifth one is to love with deeds and with truth. John, 1 John 3.18. Little children, let us not love with words or talk, but in deed and in truth. Dear God in heaven,